So where do we go now? Embracing the new leadership paradigm for facility management. So, you know, I'm being an old country boy, and I spoke, I think, at a previous event, and I talked about being a country boy and thinking about coon hunting and all this other stuff. But being a country boy, this thing, that word paradigm, I had to figure out what that damn thing meant. You know, and with leadership, and when it said paradigm, you know, is that a change or what? So I had to kind of look it up like, what is a paradigm? Okay, what, what is a paradigm? So I had to go to the dictionary, like we was taught back in the day. I didn't go on the internet. In my day, we went, we went to the dictionary. You know, old Welch just pull it out, and we could read a little bit, and it says, an outstanding, clearly, clear or typical example of an archetype, a philosophical, theoretical framework of a discipline which theories, laws, and generalizations performed in support of them are formulated broadly. The two words here, generalizations and broadly, General, generalizations in research mean that we can take something we find and we can spread it across a larger body and assume it to be pretty accurate. Okay, so we can agree that facilities and what we do is leadership. There has to be some generalizations that we know to be pretty true, that we know. I, if you can't keep it cool, you're not going to keep a job in Florida. As a facilities person, let the heat be out too often, you unemployed. Pretty good idea. That's pretty good. Broadly accepted. <laughs> How many of you have been in the facilities business think if the air conditioner don't work in July, August, consistently, that we're going to keep a job? We know that's broadly and generally accepted in Florida. So we look at this. So our paradigm of leadership or how we do those things also has some caveats. And some of those caveats, okay. So, image. What is the image as leaders in physical facilities? What is the image that we want to portray? Think about it. What is our image? Or what does we have? We have an image of what we think we are, but then there's that image of what other people say, those facilities people. So, so the paradigms, we got image, value-added proposition. We know for a fact that we control large swaths of the budget. We impact large swaths of the budget. We can't get around it. So that's one of our paradigms. We know that's to be a fact. So we have to do that. Image, value-added proposition. I think I've got to stand next to this thing. Jeez. Okay. We know one of the other things that we can, we, this paradigm, more with less. How often do we get budget increases? Or we get told, you know, can you give a little back? I can remember in 2009, I had projects getting ready to come out the ground, and they were like, hey, see if the contractor will stop and how much would it cost to stop it? Or we need to cut some positions and we got to cut some budget because we got a downturn in the state. So that thing about more with less, or you have the same budget, you get new buildings, and you expect it to stay flatline budget. So that's a current paradigm in physical facilities. How would you like to operate your house like that, where you go build, you got a house, you build another house on addition to the same, double the size of your house, but you don't expect to pay any more money. You got to figure out how to do it. We get asked that all the time in facilities. And you're talking about leadership. That's leadership to figure that one out consistently. Okay, and without going to jail doing it. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of ways to go to jail in physical facilities. There's a lot of ways to end up with stripes. And I, my mama told me I don't look good in stripes. Let me speak this morning. Stripes for me don't get along. So repackaging initiatives. So we got to repackage certain things. And some of that is how we look, how we do business, how we deal with things. But we got to do that repacking of initiatives. That's one of the other, other paradigms. Measurement and verification. What we do sometimes is hard to measure. When I did my dissertation research, one of the hardest things I found was how do I determine what people like 
in buildings? How do you measure it? How do I link facilities to educational outcomes? How do you do it? Hell, we know it affects outcomes. If you ever sit in a hot classroom or a classroom didn't have good, good air, air movement and you're going to sleep in it or it's so cold you want to climb under the table, we know it affects it, but we don't know. But we, it's hard to measure that. So how do we do that? So that's the other. So let's get it. And then the fact, last one is education and training. So we got to escape the past, guys. One of the paradigms we're going to talk about the other one is tenure, not always skills and competence. There's a picture I want to pop up here in a second. Okay, come on up here. So, image. Think about it. A lot of the image that people tell facilities, you'll be surprised how many people. <laughs> well, wait, hold on. So bend over in sons. Image does matter. So guys, one of the ways that we have, we have to fight on a daily basis as leaders and facilities, we have to make sure that image is something that we're portraying. We're just not the, guy, the person walking out with a damn plunger and unstopping the toilet. There's so much other stuff that goes on that gets done in facilities that people don't know. Think about how many times in the middle of the night you got something running or you got something, got, you figured out a way. We was talking, I was just talking to a contract, talking to one of the vendors a few minutes ago. How many of y'all ever did a no-blow fuse because you didn't have one and you had to stand there because you needed to get a piece of equipment running because you had an event with a thousand people sitting there and you stuck a bolt where a fuse was and sat there and prayed that it didn't melt? So image matters, guys, of what we do. So when our staff goes out, we have to be cognizant that they cannot go out any kind of way. That's leadership. We've got to make, we've got to make sure people understand that what we do is not just this. Competence sales. People understand competence. But here's the thing that we have to do. We have to put it in a term that people understand. How many times you get asked to do something that is totally impossible? And if you can go up here and start talking about the hip, you know, uh, how many of y'all remember the, the um, what was it, uh, um, the Clampets, Beverly Hillbills, remember the guys had the hip note and the hip notes and Jed, Jed Clampett was the smart one of the bunch? Not Jed, but um, Jeffro was the smart. So my point being, this competence things we have to make sure people, we are putting people in front of people that know what they're talking about but can explain it. You can have professors can ask you some of the weirdest things sometimes. Can we do this? Yes, with enough money. So we have to make sure that we understand that. Because the past, a lot of people look at us and think that's what the image is. So we have to make sure that new paradigm is that we sell the image that we're a bunch of professionals. We have professional staff. Even, even our non-degree staff, these guys with this 30 years of HVAC experience and plumbing experience and blah, 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 and all this stuff, we have to sell that knowledge that we have that ability and skill sets. That's part of that paradigm of leadership we have to do on a consistent basis. What the hell? <laughs> okay. Let's see if this is going to do this thing. All right, how many of y'all remember this movie with Superman? Okay, Superman here didn't jump on this track because he wanted to. He did it because he could. He needed to, not because he wanted it, he needed to. A lot of the stuff we do is because we need to do it. So we need to figure out how to toot our own horn also. Because the things that we do in the middle of the night and when people are gone and whatever, we have to be able to toot that horn without bragging about it. Superman is not going to go in the bar and talk about, yeah, I just saved a train full of people, man, I got on the track and blah. He's just going to fly off. That's good. But we also got to toot our own horn when we can. 
In a lot of cases, just the facts. Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. We don't have to embellish it. It's the facts. We know what we do. How many of y'all meet with your deans, meet with your higher-ups on a consistent basis to just give them a rundown of where we are, the state of the facilities? It's a good idea. If you're not doing it, we need to be doing it. What are we doing? Okay, that VP of administration and finance, they know because most of us work for that person. But what about those deans and those other people that are in leadership on the campus? They need to know. Quality customer service. Where is it, what is it, and why? Customer service, a lot of time, is not whether or not you can do what somebody asks you to do. A lot of time, it's about explaining the process. A person says, hey, I need a new facility. Okay, yeah, I agree. It's not something that we can do out of our operation dollars. They don't know. So we have to explain that. This subject matter expert research, there's nothing worse than present something to people that are smarter than you think that they are. And they ask questions that, you know, that old deer in the headlight, like, uh oh. So don't BS. Be prepared that somebody may have done some research when you're explaining something. Because we don't want that bend over in sons image again with the old cheeks showing. We want them to look at, okay. Or, and there's nothing wrong with saying, that's a good question. Let me get back to you. Stock answer. Let's bullets fly and then you make a decision. But in most cases, that's a good thing. But prepare, be prepared to go out when we're doing this thing and we're presenting ourselves that we know what the hell we're talking about. And you send people to them. There's nothing wrong with, there's nothing worse than the rumor mill when somebody goes up and tells somebody something that's not accurate and that gets passed on. Before long, hey, we shutting down the chiller plant for the next two weeks. What? We, was, we need to shut down just your room for an hour to fix this. But it's the chiller plant. Subject matter experts. Quality control. I don't have to mention, tell you all about quality control. What we do is always as easy to fix it one time than to keep going back multiple times if to do it right. Even if you have to tell a person, we don't have it now. We'll come back. We'll be back. And be honest. Look, it's three weeks. How many of you all have ordered parts, a simple part, and you get told it's going to be six weeks before you can get that? That's the life we're living right now. There's no use of BSing it. Just tell them. It's six weeks. It is what it is. Unless they're related to the superintendent. Then you try to figure out something that's around it. <laughs> I, didn't say, I didn't say that as, as when Arthur said, all pigs are not created equal. Yeah, well, I did not say that. <laughs> Cutting edge, bleeding edge, guys. When we take on this thing about two trone horn quality customer service, we want to be on the cutting edge of new stuff, figuring out how to do stuff, finding new ways around, like that superintendent situation. I can't get you this, but I can get you this temporary unit. And I have somebody come dump the water, you know, once a day. Not to, not to fix, but it's a solution. Okay? So cutting edge, bleeding edge. Value added proposition. All right. So, value, that value added proposition, the other paradigm. We know the facility built environment. And when I say the facility built environment, I'm talking not just what's within the walls, I'm talking about the grounds also. I had a college president tell me one time that the most important thing to his campus was his driveway in from the main inter intersection. And I'm like, huh? He like, a parent put, taking their kid to college, and it was a small private college, he says the first thing they see is that the grass cut. Is it manicured? And then they see the custodian's neck, the cleaning. Then they pay attention to whether the light's out or blah, 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 the paint, whatever. But they look at that grounds and that cleaning. 
the first thing they jump, the first thing they look at. So we know that when we know that the facility built environment is the largest expenditure of funds, the second largest, and we know what the first is, right? Is what? People. I'm sorry, utilities. Ah, kill me. ROI, curb appeal, know your call centers, energy, personnel, deferred maintenance. Those are the items. Think about it. We know we got, we basically control almost the largest expenditure of funds on any organization. We have, and then we impact everything else. Research, all the other stuff that they do, we impact it. So we have to be this person, this group that always looking at these different paradigms of how we operate. Soothsayer, mystic, magician, physics, ESP. We got to look ahead. So when that superintendent's called, this, this was it, James here and said, James? James figured out that, you know, I knew he was going to call me. I had that feeling. I had just had this tingling. It's kind of like when your wife look at you when you did something you didn't supposed to do. You're like, oh, damn, I know what's coming now. <laughs> so we, we know that. So we know these things that can bite us. And if we know these things that can bite us, we should plan for them. One time you get bit, the next time you did it intentionally. It was, has some intentionality to it if you keep getting bit by the same thing. That's bad leadership if you keep sticking your hand in that hole and the snake keep biting you. You get well, you come back again and try it again. Next time you try Bud Light instead of Budweiser and you stuck your hand in again, you know it's a problem. That vision, the more with less, dwindling budgets, same expectations. Think about it. Has anybody told you, even with less staffing, the worst labor market I've seen in my lifetime, that they expect anything less? Has anybody came to you, James, and said, James, you don't have to clean the buildings as well as you used to? No, you won't hear it. They may say, well, what are you going to do to fix this? Or how are you going to deal with this employee shortage? And you say, well, I need to get them to $15 an hour. Well, we ain't got the money for that. So what do you do? Same expectations, guys. But what helps us with this is if we can do things like measure. Cost per square foot. Stamp. Did I just whistle? Damn. Okay. Cost per square foot, staff, and energy. We know that we should be able to at a quickly tell somebody that want to know why we're doing that. How much time I got? I thought you were showing me the clock, the watch. Oh, okay. 14 minutes? Okay, good. All right. I saw the watch. I was like, okay. Hey, man, see? I, hey. So, staffing and energy. Those two things, we should be able to know what our cost per square foot is. We should know that. We should know that. We should be able to produce that because you will get asked consistently. So we should have that information. Energy. What is it costing us to take care of these buildings? Maintain the grounds. The other piece is we're doing something called TCO, total cost of ownership. And we're trying to do it per building because I want, I want to be able to tell my boss on any given day that this building here costs us this much per square foot when I look at energy, cleaning, maintenance, parts, everything that goes in there, I want to be able to say this is what it costs to maintain this building per square foot, that TCO. Because that helps us to be able to justify what we're doing, but it also says we got to look at other things that if it doesn't make sense, don't do it. I refuse to put a painter on my staff. Why would we? I can hire, there's, there's a million paint companies out there. I'm not going to pay for a painter. Some things just don't make sense for us to do. And then the other thing is operating dollars to generate energy savings. Think about it. During the pandemic, one of the things that helped us on the utility side, on the energy side, and on our maintenance side of the house when I couldn't hire people, was that we had converted all, a lot of the buildings to LED. So I didn't need as many maintenance persons, like in the library. 
The library used to damn to be a full-time person daily going in there changing lights when it was fluorescence. You go change out 200 lights on Monday and Wednesday you got another 100 to change out. We changed them all to LEDs for seven years. Now, unfortunately, we're getting close to that seven years, so maybe I can get through retirement and these guys can take care of that deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so that, we get energy savings and we get maintenance savings just by looking at operation dollars or how can we save money. So these LEDs and these energy retrofits and other stuff, outsourcing those things that make sense. Well, we use our existing dollars if we can buy it cheaper and then save something down the stream, it makes sense for us. So we have to look at that as part of our paradigms and how we do new stuff. Public-private partnerships, outsourcing, in some kind of ways, guys, in this market, we don't have no choice. Some things we just got to outsource. The days of saying we're going to do each and everything for everybody, we just don't have it. We can't do the, what, I used to, what we used to call the freebies, where everybody wanted, hey, can you do me this favor? You do enough favors and you're looking for a job. You're going to need a favor to pay the rent. So you can't do favors for, when I say favors, you can't, you got to have processes. You got to get people to invest in a process and you got to see where it makes sense to outsource those things. If you got a building that sits 20,000, you know, 10 miles from the campus or whatever and the windshield time to maintain it, do you really want to send two custodians over there every day? Or do you just hire, hire a cleaning company to go over there? It, you have to make those decisions, but you cannot be caught in this mentality where I'm I can outsource anything. Some things make sense. And as leaders, we have to make those calls. And we have to be willing to make those calls. Because in some cases, it's the only, way, only thing that makes sense. And if the private sector can do it better, let them do it and pay them to do it. One less issue to worry about. All right. Repackaging. Sustainability. Sustainability has become like a dirty word in our business. And it's dirty because everybody has linked everything to sustainability. Everything that comes out. If somebody brings out another one product, the first thing they say is, look, my brick in this paver is sustainable. Okay? Okay? We're trying to figure it out. I'll give them credit. But sustainability, we've got to basically link sustainability to educational outcomes where it's not dirty. And when I was working on my doctorate degree, my research, when, we, when I ask educators about sustainability, they lowered it, they basically dropped it real low on their scale. And I'm like, why? And what some of them told me was, when you start talking sustainability, you're taking away from my education. You're taking away my books. You're taking away my classroom space. You're taking away that. Because that's what they think. Because they also thinking about green roofs and all this other stuff that may not make sense in our area. So in this case, we have to make sure that we link these outcomes. Thermal comfort, lighting, IQ. We got to basically look for technology. Wi-Fi, smart classroom, electrical outlets, which is hard in older buildings. Size does matter. Some of these spaces and whatever, we got, we got requirements for how big classrooms have to be and they, they have these sections. So we got to be cognizant of that when we build buildings but we also got to be real cognizant when we renovate buildings that we've got to pay attention to this, this size element of what they need. Because if a class, you build a 100-person classroom and you only got 20 students to go in it, duh. <laughs> Don't make a lot of sense. So we got to make sure we understand that. We also got to recognize that we are competing with every other college and university sitting out there in the world and distance learning. People can go learn in their living room, Starbucks, Applebee's. And drinking a beer at the time. So where would you be? L listen to a professor on the stage or drinking a cold beer and, you know, getting you some, getting you some old dip or something while you're sitting there? You know what I mean, where would you prefer to go to class at? So there's a competition out here. These learning commas. 
renovation, new construction. So what I'm getting at, guys, we can't stay in these old paradigms and expect with the competition of higher ed, it's a lot of competition. Every one of the state universities is in competition with each other. The community colleges are in competition with the state universities. Now, K-12 is basically producing students that already got two-year degrees. There's a lot of competition. And if we don't figure out that we're just not, they're going to just hand us the students, and without students, we don't have jobs. We don't have jobs. And, and I, don't even, I want to say we don't even have a purpose. Quickly on this, measurement and verification. Can't miss what you can't measure, pretty straightforward. Staffing, worst employment market in my lifetime. Um, this is the first market I've ever been, been where if you, it's kind of like fishing. You fishing and you know there's a lot of sharks. You get the hook on a good one. You got to get him in the boat. It ain't none of this being pretty and taking pictures. You got to be, get this ass. Just get him in here. Get, get, the, get the hook. Get the hook. Because you know if you leave the person out there dangling long enough, you won't have them. So HR, if you're not a partner with HR, you better be. Because right now, if it's taking you too long to get that person to start, if it's taking you three weeks to onboard a person, you ain't going to have them. Plus it's three, and I'm just telling you, if it's taking that long, people don't have to wait to go to work. When I was in Oklahoma years ago, you had 20 applicants for every opening. Great. Now, if you get two that's qualified, for every 20. For every 20. <laughs> and then when, when people walk up in your office and you even interview somebody, they come in there with flip-flops on, and you even actually get an interview because you, if you don't interview him, you ain't got nobody else to interview for the job. So you have to interview, and they know it. So with that being said, we have to understand what we're doing here, guys. We've got to look at it. We've got to come up with ways. We cannot sit on our laurels and be that superhero and just expect people to walk in our door anymore. Maybe we got to train some of our own people. Maybe we got to encourage some people to go to school. <laughs> We got to do something because they're not walking in out the door. We And we are, I don't know about y'all, but I see a lot of gray hair and a few comb overs and some, uh, some gray, you know, balling. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, and if, and if mine would grow out, it's got a lot of gray in it. I'm just saying, we got to, we got to deal with this. On the energy side, the same thing, guys. We've got to get control of our energy on that side of the house and make sure that we are basically providing the, the environmental conditions we need, but we also got to do it in an environmental friendly manner. So if you got chillers that break down every day, and if you got money, you need to fix the chillers because that goes back to our image. If the only thing, oh, here they come again, fix, kick this old air conditioner again to get it started again. We've got to do that because we know energy and we know where our energy is, energy centers are, and we've got to make sure that we're fixing those where we can. So in this education, training, technology, again, certification, Apple does a great job with certifications. They got them out there. We need to try to get our staff to take advantage of them. A lot of the local communities have trade schools that we can partner with. If we can't, we need to try to. Because, get, look, we're not getting a lot of these people. The aging, aging facility management workforce. That's what I was talking about. Every time you can get a youngster in and can try to train them, we need to do that. Because, guys, I mean, I'm looking around this room. The vast majority of us, with the exception of a few, within 10 years are going to probably be driving a golf cart. Got, a, you know, a cooler on the side of it, a couple of flags on it. I plan to have some 20s on mine and a flag, you know, a little boom going. You know, it's going to be the Commodores. It ain't going to be none of that new stuff. It's going to be the Commodores, some of that kind of stuff. Some, you know, some of that good music. You know, it's going to be that kind of stuff. But that's what, in 10 years, that's what most of us are going to be. With the exception of, like, my new project manager over there, Danny. She's still, she, she's young. And we got to find some of them. You got any friends? <laughs> <laughs> so, recruitment. Grow and train young. Steal talent when possible. 
So I will give all you all warning. If you brought staff here and they willing to move to Jacksonville and they got a skill set, I may talk to them over a beer. Now, I'm not trying to steal any people, but yeah, I will steal your people. But <laughs> shrink to grow. Sometimes that's kind of that's kind of oxymoron, shrink to grow. Sometimes we need to shrink our organization just to look at those places that it doesn't make sense to have people. And maybe those people need to get reallocated to do something else. Maybe it makes sense that, you know, you're the, you know, you know, the, you're the pressure washer, bubble maker, blah, whatever, some oddball. What, what do you really do? Oh, I need an administrative assistant. Come on, come on here. You know how to answer the phone, right? Yeah. You just became the bubble maker, pressure washer, receptionist. Sometimes we got to shrink the grow. We got to look at where we have resources and see if we can tap those resources. Technology as a workflow multiplier, continuous evaluation and reevaluation of department missions and goals. If anybody here don't know what their university or their organization's mission and goals are and how you play into those missions and goals, you probably need to rethink it. Because you should. Because at the end, if we're going to be that value added proposition, and take the leadership role of trying to make sure this mesh, we got to know how we fit with the mission and goals of the organization. It's highly important what we do. No one is exempt from technology. I've got a young, I got some staff members that are whizzes on the computers and they can figure out anything. And I'm, I, I'm not ashamed to call them and say, hey, how the hell you do this? And they come there. Dude, hell at home, I call my grandson. Man, that little rascal go there and he's two. <laughs> He come there and throw his fingers. Here you go, Granddad. I'm like, well, damn, that was helpful. <laughs> but I'm just saying. So nobody's exempt from technology. It's going to get us all. It's going to get us all. But right now, they haven't figured out how to go fix certain things. And we still need a man, man with a wrench, a man or woman with a wrench. And so as long as that's the case, we're going to always have a job. But technology is coming. And when you can, automate when practical. Some things make sense. When I first started in this business, how we determined what, whether we was going to heat or cool. Yep, it's a cooling day. Turn on, turn, turn on the chillers. It's a heating day. Flip it to heating. And then back, back and forth, back and forth. But that's how we did it. If you are doing that, and we are leading in our organizations, we got to try to move past that or figure out how to get there. Because that's leadership. That's what we do. We provide the framework and the road for that. So guys, this was kind of a pep talk because leadership to me is about people. It's about trying to get people to do things that they may not normally would do. And what we are in a unique situation now because it's hard for us to find people. It's going to get harder. If you go look at any of the labor forecasts, if you go look at where we're heading in our industry, we can't stick on the laurels of it's a good, safe place to work with benefits. That can't be our only selling point to operate a facilities that we can give you good benefits and we don't fire you very often unless you really screw up. <laughs> that can't be our main selling point. Because now you really got to really work hard to get fired. I mean, you got to work damn hard. And they're like, what you do? You ran a professor over the golf cart? I'll give you a two-day suspension. Be back when you back then. <laughs> just, joking, just, just joking. Just joking. Just joking. Just joking. But seriously, guys, what we do is important to our organizations. And we are that person that hold it. We're that Superman that's holding that track together more times than, more times than often. And they don't know it. We are, we, we are not heralded. We are not the ones that are going to show up on the banner that, hey, fish fact saved the day. We don't give a damn. But what we do know, when we do get a chance, we need to be able to shine. And we do every day. So that's my take on leadership and facilities and what we do and how we do it. Any questions? Any comments? James? We've been doing so much for so little for so long, we're not qualified to do anything with nothing. <laughs>
I got to I got to get that one. I got to use that one. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The, 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 the automated vacuum cleaners and stuff like that, they're coming. They're coming quickly. I'm not sold on that automated lawnmower yet. I just, I just got this mental thing in my head by somebody on the green, a green space, and that lawnmower makes, it makes a mishap. I don't want that phone call. I ain't there yet. I'll let the next director figure that one out. Will, that's yours. I, I ain't going to do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it's coming. I mean, there are places that, that make sense. If you got fields with no people around, whatever, they're automated. there's automated equipment. They got farms out west that are using nothing but automated equipment to do all the planting, the basically plowing, all that stuff is being done by this automated equipment. It's coming, guys. So that's why I said when we talk about technology and stuff, we've got to be willing to embrace it when it comes. I'm just not going to deal with that damn automated lawnmower and them students lying around the green. I ain't getting that call. No, I'm not getting that call. Our athletic position already gets the robots to clean the field. Yeah. If it's exciting too, I think if I could go back and like where when I came out of school, they said um, prepare for seismic change, but it has such an exponential rate. It's not just change generation to generation. They said it was just like watching a rocket every minute. And it's been a lot, but I still realize without why I would say higher education matters is of your work and personal yeah. family, if we're just going to hijack your onto a Starbucks, you're not going to grow your network that's going to translate. Uh, agree. You can't just get that all from YouTube, and that's why being in the conference matters and asking for the help of those dynamic yeah. generations. It's, it's, you're not going to grow as a human without other great humans. Agree. But I can just tell you, there's, there's studies out there that say that our grandkids, there's jobs they'll be doing that don't even exist today. It is, but if they got to go to Mars, I ain't going. <laughs> I ain't doing no facilities on Mars at the bottom of the ocean. I don't do those. The moon, they hire somebody else for that one. I just, I just, I'm just not going there. I don't need to meet one of them. I got that one 30, I got that one covered. <laughs> I've covered that one 35 years ago. That's covered. <laughs> and, and that's only a one time, that's only a one time, that's only a one time deal there. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other comments for the group? All right, guys. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your conference.